All right. Good evening and welcome to, uh, let's say, uh, an educational stream this evening. Uh, today I will be working through, uh, because I've noticed some people were struggling a little bit with um, how to use MoTeC, how to read the data uh, and such. So uh, today I'll be working through basically actually from the bare bones. So what I've done is um, uninstalled MoTeC and uh, I'll show you kind of the process to go through to import the workspace as needed and uh, how to uh, read and utilize the data as much as possible. So I've set up a kind of a short PowerPoint. Won't be, it's really, really short. It's three slides. <laughs> so it's not exactly a long kind of lecture or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's just going to be uh, just a quick uh, kind of walk through basically of what I'll be covering and then most of it will be uh, using uh, ACC and jumping between ACC and MoTeC and utilizing everything. So uh, if you just give me a moment, I'm just going to do something very quickly with my phone and uh, and then we'll get started. So just one moment. Okay, so just I wanted to change something as well, which was to change my uh, OBS. I managed to get push to talk to work, which is nice um, with my uh, with my steering wheel. But uh, I figured actually there's a good chance I'll forget. I'll forget how to press the button and all that kind of stuff. So um, so figured that's a bit better, and I have my phone. Uh, enabled for using the chat as well, so that I can read the chat. If you guys have any questions, then you can fire away. Uh, so yes, the MoTeC guide. So yes, yeah, so that's just making sense of the graphs and numbers uh, to optimize car setup and driving technique. You can use it for both of those things. Uh, so the some of the topics we'll, we'll be trying to cover today. Uh, hopefully, you can see everything. Yes, you can see everything correctly. Uh, is just the installation, so the process of installing MoTeC, importing the uh, Kunos ACC workspace, uh, enabling the telemetry logger in Acero Corsa Competizione, um, and then once we move on from that, then uh, it's kind of working through the workbooks, the worksheets within those workbooks. Um, Basically, you can imagine a workbook as being just like a, a collection of worksheets. Uh, I suppose hence the term workbook and worksheets. So uh, that's uh, so we'll be kind of working through that. Unfortunately, the base uh, project that uh, was provided uh, doesn't have all the data that is actually output from ACC. So um, I'll be showing you how to. Uh, set up additional workbooks and additional worksheets and having them displayed in kind of a nice way. Um, and then alt finally, of course, then it's understanding and utilizing the data. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, download uh, the latest version of the MoTeC i2 Pro software. So if I click on the link here, uh, it's just loading it now and uh, we'll switch over to uh, Chrome. So we'll just transition here. So this is my Chrome page here. And uh, so we open this link. So this is to download the software uh, as needed. So um, the first thing we'll do is you look for the I2. So there's a load of different programs on here. Um, you have engine management, you have engine management, early generations, data acquisition and displays. So 
Um, the Motec guys, they make proper logger software for real racing cars. Um, so what we're interested in is just basically the i2 Pro um, program, which is free to download. So depending on which version of, uh, if you have a 32-bit system or a 64-bit system, which most people should have at this stage, I would think, 32-bit's uh, kind of gone out of uh, use a long time ago. Um, so we'll download, I'm going to download the 64-bit version here. Um, actually, let me, one moment, uh, let me use... Uh, display capture as opposed to um, the Chrome capture. So if we go and transition, there we go. So that way you can see me clicking around and downloading things. Uh, no, that's the wrong one. <laughs> it's the 32-bit version, which is slightly newer, apparently. Uh, but we'll download the 64-bit version because I have a 64-bit system. So I'm just going to save this to the desktop for now. So we'll download that. Or actually, may as well, I'll just, well, I, I did download it before. So may as well just uh, get straight just that install it straight away. Uh, so if we go into, uh, I have this thing stored in my ACC zips, yes. So we have this program here. So we're gonna just go through the uh, installation process. Um, hopefully you guys can see all of this happening. Um, click next, uh, let's say accept, yes, yes. And boom. So that's MoTeC already installed at this point. Um, so the next part then is importing the workspace. So go straight to the desktop and MoTeC here is installed. So we'll just uh, open it up here and you'll be presented with a new workspace wizard. We don't need a new workspace right now. Um, and then you click on import or open an existing workspace, click import. And if you go, so basically to get the workspace that comes with ACC, you go to your documents folder, set of course of Compressione, go to MoTeC, workspaces, base ACC. And there's a file here called the workspace.i2wsp. And then you'll see it there. So click OK, there we go. So that's the project loaded as it is. Nothing there because there's no data. So what I'm gonna do now is we'll jump into ACC and uh, basically, um, oh, Okay, there we go. So what I'll do now is just basically just jump into ACC to enable the telemetry logger. And then um, I'll show you, just do a couple of random laps. It's not about lap time, but it's just about doing, just getting the data essentially at this point. So let me just go load up ACC here and uh, we get to it. So it's loading at the moment. So hopefully it shouldn't take too long. I have it installed on a solid state drive, so it shouldn't take too long. Yep, we're nearly there. And uh, I'm just gonna put on some gloves because I usually use gloves when I drive. So it's something that I recently started doing. And it's much, much better <laughs> than driving barehanded, especially with the calluses. Yeah, I was getting calluses on my uh, on my thumbs and stuff. So hopefully, so we'll do a transition. So now we're in ACC. And uh, so let's go uh, drive. Yeah, we'll just drive here at Suzuka. 
and start. All right, so one thing I'll do just at this point is um, Uh, hold on a moment, sorry. Uh, why, is it, why is it doing that? Okay, that's weird. I shouldn't have opened my uh, Discord window there. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to do a quick change here for my uh, wheel profile to load the, uh, load the Ferrari one. There we go, that's loaded in Final Labs. And so this is, yeah, this is the part about enabling the telemetry logger. So we have, it doesn't really matter which setup you use, but the main thing here is this section here. So if we go, we have electronics, where this is where you adjust your uh, ABS and trash control settings and ECU maps. You also have this telemetry lapse uh, section, which is default at zero. So what we're gonna do is actually just gonna increase that to say five. I'm not gonna do a whole load of laps. I'm just gonna do a couple, and uh, don't need to do any setup changes go, go, go. at this point. Um, and let me sorry, let me just change a couple of things quickly. Uh, no, not here. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Just keep that manual. I'm just gonna switch it to my uh, different control profile. And do a few laps, I'll just uh, dial the game audio down a little bit. All right, so that'll be all right. So away we go. Just gonna do a couple laps. Uh, so now, don't really have to do anything. All it's doing now is logging telemetry as soon as you start, basically as soon as you leave the pits. And basically, one thing to keep in mind is that it's not logging any telemetry or it doesn't save anything until you return back to the pits or you leave the session uh, or leave a server. So it's important that you do return, uh, return to the pits. Basically, teleport back to the garage. You don't actually have to do very much. Uh, you don't have to actually physically drive back to the pits. But, uh, so this is going to be a bit scruffy, so I apologize if the driving is a little bit off. So what I'll do is, I'll do two laps. I'll do actually three. And then I'll show you a little bit of what, how the data would look. I'm not really liking this aggressive preset setup. I did make a couple of changes to it. A little bit more arrow, a bit more rake. But I'll just use this for demonstration purposes for now. Left, so we go right, don't go too wide on the right to get a good line into the left. And enter the right from the inside. Oh, a little bit too quick on entry, but we're okay. And then make sure to get a good line up to Dunlop or through Dunlop. Oh, 
bit on the grass there. Right into the first Stagner. Break. Put the inside curve. Go. Whoa. Let's go into the second one. To the hairpin. To the uh, 200R. Just a long, long sort of double or triple apex right hander. And to the first of the spoon curves. Break. Don't go too slow into the first part. And you have to go a little bit slower into the second part. A little bit of oversteer there. And on to the corner where everyone basically, yeah, tense into the 130R. So lift a little, a oh, little bit wide, laps invalidated, but no big deal. Telemetry still logging as normal. And on to out of the chicane, onto the start finish straight. One more lap. Neater through there. Be a little bit better through there. A bit of a uh, bit of a slide around the apex there of the second spoon curve. A lift here. Oh, we're okay. Survived. couple of laps there's a reason why I did two and not just the one and uh, so we'll turn to garage and there we go so that's saved the telemetry already in that run so now we go into um, Motec so hopefully yeah, do transition so there you go and we'll just turn off the uh, background audio for clarity for now. So now the next bit is um, loading the uh, telemetry file. So if we go, you'll see here at the top left, so this is the workspace already loaded. So we click the little, there's a plus and a green icon at the top left, so we'll do that. And then again, you want to go to your documents folder, a set of course competizione here, and you want to go into Motec. So this may take a little bit of time because I have a lot of telemetry files. So hopefully, hopefully it doesn't take too long. But yeah, so that's loading. There we go. So you'll see, so right now I did some running at 
other circuits like Laguna Seca, Paul Ricard, Kayalami, you know, all of that. So, but the most recent, so the way, something I would recommend if you want to always try and ensure that your most recent run is at the top, is basically you can sort by date and time here in the, uh, the date and time column. So that way, I have it set that way. So every time I do a run, the latest run comes out of the top instead of you having to find the run that you did and all that. Um, and the venue here says Suzuka. So that's what we're, that's where we're just running. So we'll open that and there we go. Now the graphs are filled and we can see what's going on. Um, so there is uh, 10 worksheets in the base project. So let me just uh, mute uh, ACC for myself as well. So the first one we have is called the comparison worksheet. So essentially this can be used for uh, comparing uh, runs between um, either your own runs based on different, different driving technique or your uh, or it might be more commonly used for comparing your technique with another driver. Um, so one thing you can do as well, so this is just looking at the, there's two laps here, or there's three laps. There's the out lap, the uh, first hot lap, and the second hot lap. And something I do to make life a little bit easier is that you'll notice there's a, a dock option here where you can click here, and there you go, snap. Instead of the thing hiding away each time you move your mouse away, you know, you can always just, you can just have it staying there the whole time. And what I can do, although it will probably won't be very different between the two runs, is show you how the comparison thing works. So let's see if we can get, okay, yeah, we'll go with the, uh, with the white for now. So you can, you have two options for comparison. You can compare um, basically just two laps at a time which is the, so you have the red, which is the current lap or the main lap that you're looking at. Um, and then you have a white section. Obviously, if you put white on the same thing, no difference. <laughs> um, but uh, you can do this just to compare two laps at a time. Let's say you wanted to compare, if you want to go really crazy about it, you can compare three laps at a time or four laps at a time. Uh, so then you have all these squigglies but let's just let's just simplify it for now we'll keep it just two laps at a time so um if we look here for example so on so to compare just comparing you know trying to use this compare graph so the first the top graph here is speed simply that's the speed the car is traveling at um, so you'll notice here that uh, on my second lap which probably makes more sense because it's kind of already a little bit warmed up after a couple of laps uh i'm braking a little bit later and uh losing speed a little bit later so i'm braking a little bit later and then even if you look at the the uh the bottom two graphs which is the brake and throttle inputs so that shows the, rough you know a, a percentage of your throttle inputs and your brake input so the purple uh graph or the purple line here which is the second last from the bottom is the braking and then the red one is the throttle so the throttle is quite similar a little bit ragged in places it's much smoother there on the white lap through that section of the track and actually to uh, make make it a little bit more readable uh, something that you can do as well. And if you, yeah, if you double click on the lap, so you can, if you use your mouse wheel, you can zoom in on a section or zoom out of a section and so on. Uh, so one thing you can do as well, so that you can say, okay, well, well yeah, I see the graphs, but what point of the track I'm at, you know? So you can do this thing called show track or, okay, not show track, we use show values. So at the moment, this is a problem that everyone, you, you just have to kind of, it's just something you have to do. So the track map is all sorts of messed up. So one thing you can do is click tools at the top, the, uh, the tools toolbar, track editor. Then we can do generate track. 
and it defaults uh, normally to the GLAT, which is fine. That's what you want. But one thing to keep in mind is to also understand the track layout in the sense, is it a uh, closed circuit? Most circuits are like Spa, Monza, um, but uh, a track like Suzuka in particular is a crossover track because there's a section of the track where you go under, where you go through Degner 2 and you go under a bridge. Um, and that bridge section is actually the straight that leads up to the 130R. So that's that's where the, the crossover point happens. So make sure to select the crossover option depending on the track. So there's very few tracks which cross over. Uh, Suzuka is one of them. Fiorano is one of them. Uh, ah, Venisto, uh, a Finnish track, is also one of them. But the majority of tracks, um, at least in ACC, uh, don't cross over. So you can just select closed and it'll be OK. But in the case of Suzuka, it is uh, it does cross over. And there you go. So then that's recognizable. And that's Suzuka. So you can see uh, the track layout perfectly now. So um, so that's, that's a way that you can also, um, let me just try something here. Uh, can we make this larger? Yes, we can. So you can do that as well. So you can have a separate track window if you wanted um, as well, as opposed to um, the little value section in the bottom right. I prefer the values option personally. I like to have the data here and then I can just quickly glance over at the uh, um, at the track at the bottom right. So again, uh, if we do this, so this is comparing the two runs. So if we look through here, so I'm breaking a little bit later for turn one compared to the uh, my first hot lap. At the same time, though, I am losing a little bit more speed here than I did on the first hot lap. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. It's not just about if you break later. And this is why I I do iterate quite a bit about the idea um, that it's not really about how late you can break into a corner, but it's also how your overall speed through the corner. That's the entry, the midpoint, as well as the exit. So even though I did break later, and there's if we look here at the legend, uh, so this shows the actual numerical value between the two laps. So even though I break later, so I'm 10 about, yeah, starts off at about 15 kilometers an hour difference, roughly goes down to about 10. Then they start kind of getting closer. And then I lose a little bit of speed because probably I braked a bit too late. So I'm having to wait a little bit to get on the throttle, um, perhaps. And, that, and that's causing that slight speed variance. In this case, it was actually better to brake later because if you just look very quickly, there's a lot more speed there. Uh, and there's a kind of a loss of about five kilometers here. So I did go quicker, you could say, on the second hot lap. Um, and then I had a better, uh, I guess, yeah, cleaner exit as well, uh, going through the second part as well, or I didn't uh, lose as much speed breaking into the second part. Um, so yeah, anyway, without kind of, I don't want to get too carried away with each individual thing, but uh, basically, you know, this is a, a good way to try and compare uh, your own laps, trying different things between laps, uh, but also if you wanted to uh, compare your run with a, another driver's run, this is a this is a handy graph to use. So it shows as well RPMs here in the purple line, uh, shows gearing. Uh, so if you want to compare gearing and uh, you know you have also brake and throttle input as well. So that's all great. It's all very useful information for uh, comparison purposes. So if we go here then driver, very similar graph, it's the very similar worksheet to the first one. The only uh, differences is now we have a steer angle graph showing the uh, steering input. So that's kind of uh, 
you could always overlay that as well with another driver and compare are you steering as much as another guy or not steering at all and so for example and this is yeah so the 130r i think yeah this is going through the 130r so you'll notice something quite uh eye opening here which is this if you look at the white line so on the red lap i went through the 130r lifted off i did run a bit wide the lap was invalidated but it's all smooth inputs on the second lap i had a complete opposite lock moment and you can see that already in the graph so here there's a difference of 200 degrees in steering angle or actually uh 286 at the peak roughly around that so that was because i was going pretty much uh 180 degrees opposite lock to the right so that's why you see that kind of big uh disparity um and then you can also see actually in speed as well so because i had to do a massive correction and what's my throttle input like yeah so i'm already on full throttle here at this point um on the red lap but i've had to lift a little bit because of the oversteer moment i lost some speed um and the g lat is bleh, all over the place so um so yeah you can use the comparisons for any of the graphs it's not just the compare graph or the compare worksheet rather but you can use it for any of the graphs at all uh, so it's all very uh useful stuff um and yeah so as i mentioned as well we have the g lat and the g long which uh is at the very bottom of the uh the worksheet so this the g lat is the uh your lateral g force so that's going down a straight that won't change very much really at all if anything it's just will hold at zero but once you enter a corner then you get these this massive lateral g force um, and under braking and acceleration as well that'll change so the g long is uh, short for the uh, longitudinal g-force so that's forward and back motion while the g-lat is the uh, the lateral motion so that's primarily to do with cornering uh, so that's something additional that you can have with the uh, um, in this worksheet compared to the compare worksheet then we go into wheel speed so we'll take away the overlay for now so this is really handy for determining um, whether you're locking brakes or um, yeah whether you're locking brakes or is your traction control not tight enough is your preload setting on your uh, differential not uh, tight enough or it's too open or whatever um, so this is this is all very that's very very handy information to know um, and one thing I'm gonna do actually so this is the first thing I was talking about about how to add to the worksheet that you have so right now we have throttle and brake input which is nice but it would be nice to also have trash control and ABS activation. So what you can do is say, so in this case, I'm just gonna add it to this section. We have the uh, wheel speeds and the brake and throttle. So if you right click properties and you have two groups in this case, we have the wheel speeds for the four wheels, the left front, right front, uh, left rear and right rear. And then you also have the uh, break and throttle percentages so what we can do here is say add group and add channel so there's a lot more information that's coming out of ACC that we're what we see here and what the two things that I'm interested in or that we're interested in now is we have ABS which is there so you can look for them like this or you could simply just type it in the uh, search box and it'll come up so we click OK so now we have ABS uh, information and then we also want the trash control information as well so if i click ok boom there you go so this is showing now it, it doesn't show uh let's say it doesn't show uh, in the case of trash control abs it doesn't show 
uh, the stages of activation because the traction control actually has sort of stages of activation. I'm not sure about the ABS, but traction control definitely has sort of two or three stages of activation, at least two anyway. We don't get that information. We only get either on or off, simple as that. So in this case, I'm breaking. So in the first corner, ABS isn't kicking in, which is the, uh, the blue line or the blue spikes. But as I apply throttle coming out of turn two, see there, there's a traction control just blipping, blipping in. So it's just kicking in just a little bit. It's kind of going on and off at the beginning and then it's holding for a bit, then it goes off. Then braking for the first of the S's, quick activation on the ABS, and then we're going through here. The second part's okay, I think, yeah. No activation at all. Then the third part is activating, then it doesn't activate. And then for the last part of the S's, it activates a little bit again. And then going through uh, the uh, Dunlop curve, trash control kicks in. I think there's something wrong with the track. <laughs> So just one moment. Um, no, I'm just not reading it right, sorry. Um, apologies for the slight delay. Let's say, no, we don't need to invert that. So, oh, sorry, this is yeah, going through the, the right part. So this is the trash control kicking in and then it's not actually kicking in, uh, or it's kicking in a little bit, uh, going through the uh, the long, basically the Dunlop curve. And then if we zoom out again, so then the ABS kicks in a moment into the first Degner, and then it kicks in a lot into the second Degner, or this is the hairpin, sorry, so that's... <laughs> getting a little bit lost here, but it's okay. Yeah, so this is going to the hairpin. So this is, I would expect the ABS to kick in quite a bit here and the trash control the same as well. So that's in terms of the ABS and trash control activation. Um, so, but how does the wheel speeds come into it as well? So basically let's try and find something interesting about the wheel speed. So breaking into the first corner, uh, relatively okay, but you'll notice that the wheel speed for the right front is a little bit lower than everything else. So if you imagine you're turning into the corner, you're loading up the left side of the car. So um, the inside, the 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 the, uh, the front right, which would be the inside tire, is very light, so it has more of a tendency to lock up under braking. So that's why it's probably a little bit slower. Uh, I don't think there's necessarily any real real proper locking here, nothing alarming, but uh, there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a dip there. Um, but then interestingly, we also have these moments of the rears. So primarily you'd be worried about the front wheels under braking, but then you're worried you're think, I'm thinking more about the rear wheels under acceleration. So then you see here the right rear starts, actually this is a good example. So the, the right rear now is traveling at a higher speed as well as the left rear than the front. So that's because I'm starting to accelerate. So the right rear is an unloaded wheel. So it's, it's kind of spinning a bit more freely. And this might actually even highlight, like I said, the preload setting. So if you had a, a stronger preload setting, the uh, the rear wheels wouldn't go travel at a at a higher speed as they are now. So that's how you can sort of use the preload to uh, a way of reading um, through the wheel speeds. Uh, and let's try and find something interesting here. So this is going through the through Dunlop. So the right rear here is going a little bit nuts as well as the left rear. So there's a little bit of wheel spin here, accelerating out of the uh, Dunlop curve, which is the uh, the long uphill left-hander before the first Degner. Uh, so there's a little bit of wheel spin there, that's not good. And then uh, coming into 
the first part, so I'll probably hit the curb hard so there's a bit of a speed spike there. Uh, then breaking into the um, second Degner. Uh, so you can see there's a little bit of noise going on with the front wheels. Um, so that's showing a little bit of locking, but it's kind of pretty good. It's pretty good for the most part, under braking anyway. But yeah, you can see the rears here. Uh, so essentially looking at this graph, you can see all the, these little spikes signify moments of wheel spin essentially or braking traction. Um, so it's it's good to keep in, uh, keep a lookout for that, but as well as uh, also trying to look at um, whether you're locking the front wheels or not, so under braking. So that can inform you on how to um, adjust your ABS, uh, your uh, brake bias as well. So that's all good information to take from that as well. Anyway, uh, we'll go into the understeer, oversteer graph. So I understand most of this, most of it makes sense. Some of it's a little bit, uh, I'm not too sure of, but for the most part. So we just have speed. We saw that in the first two worksheets, all pretty straightforward stuff. Steer angle, that shows the steering angle. What's interesting actually with this, that I was kind of thinking about it a bit to myself the, uh, the other day, is that you have your steer angle, which is the red line, and you have the cyan colored line, which is your lateral g-forces. So this information can actually be useful to figuring out uh, whether, essentially whether you're scrubbing the front tires um, or not, uh, or if the car is sliding out a bit in corners. Uh, so if you see your steer angle higher than your g-lateral, so let's try and find a corner, if we can, where that's happened. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot find, oh, there's one. So that's the hairpin there. So if you look here, so that's not good. So it's a little bit tricky to... <laughs> Thank you, Horatio. Thank you. Yes, I'm a lateral G-force, yes. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so this is this is a sign of so I'm turning into the hairpin, and I'm turning in turning in quite a bit, and the the lateral g-force is not as high, so you could say that maybe uh, maybe I'm turning in too much, as far as I understand it. So one thing I shall just mention right now: I'm not an engineer. I'm just uh, I have a good understanding of some of these things, but. Um, I don't have a full in-depth knowledge of everything about the car and about setup, but I'll try to best, to, but I understand a fair bit, uh, I would say, um, but not the whole picture necessarily. Uh, and then this is one of the things I don't fully get, but it's basically, we have a, a measure of oversteer. And from, uh, if we can just actually see the maths, because I think there's the equation is in here. So that's the equation for oversteer. <laughs> scary stuff, really scary stuff. Something to do with the speed and the sine of the G lateral, I think, multiplied by the wheelbase, multiplied by the G lateral and the square root of, yeah, you get a really complex equation. So it's kind of tricky to understand. But all I know from what Aris mentioned in uh, his blog post about this is that ideally, so if we look here at the legend here, you want that number to be a little bit in the negative to have an optimal setup. If it's a positive value on average, you have too much, your car is too loose, basically too much oversteer. So that's not good. Um, Oh, he does actually have, let me just check something here. Oh, there is a max and a min line, so that's good to know. So that can give you a little bit of guidance with all of that. And as I mentioned in my pre previously, I'm not an engineer. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that's a little bit like, what kind of is going on here? 
Um, but as far as I know, this is to do with measuring acceleration at different RPMs and speeds as well. So each of these colors represents a gear, although we're missing out on the sixth gear there. Uh, but the blue here is first gear, I think. Yeah, the cyan is second, the green is third, the sort of lime colored is fourth, the orange is fifth, and then the red, which has gone off a little bit, the graph is, uh, let me try something here. No, I still don't see it. Okay. Uh, is the sixth gear. And then we have here a scatter plot, I believe they call this, uh, which shows uh, the G longitudinal or the, the longitudinal G force. And it is understandable that as you go through up the higher gears, uh, generally the, the uh, longitudinal G force would decrease because you're primarily accelerating or this hard acceleration through the first few gears, and then it sort of slowly fades off. But this kind of information, I suppose, would be useful in trying to determine optimal shift points, when the torque kicks in, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but like I said, I'm not really too knowledgeable <laughs> on, on, on this particular worksheet. This bit's interesting now. We have the suspension histograms. So this information is quite useful for determining um, your damper balance. Uh, so uh, basically every part of the suspension uh, or these GT3 cars have four-way dampers. So you can control the bump and rebound uh, on each of the four wheels, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as well as control the fast bump and the fast rebound as well. Uh, so that information is, uh, uh, so yeah, they're all fully adjustable. So you're able to uh, tune your dampers as you see fit. In the case of the histogram, so the histogram, I would say is much more, it's a much a lot easier to use with um, with the slow dampers over the fast dampers. Although you can read a little bit of what's going on with the fast dampers, but they can sort sort of show you um, the balance between the fast and slow rebound. <clears throat> so um, it's quite handy. Now, one thing I like to do personally is actually change the style. So you have this bar style, um, or just a bunch of bars, basically. And then you also have a line style. So I traditionally use lines as opposed to bars. Um, so that is maximized anyway, yep. So what does this mean? So basically, the left side, uh, so you have this sort of, um, let's say, there's a particular term for it, but you have this dotted line um, in the middle uh, or serrated, that's the word, so the serrated line down in the middle for each of the four wheels. And essentially that divides the um, bump section of the car of, the, of each wheel and the rebound section of each wheel. And then the gray part, the sort of the highlighted gray section is just, it's a way of trying to separate your slow damping, which would be in the gray sections for each of the four wheels, and your fast damping, which would be outside of those, that gray section. So now, okay, so what, how do you use this when it comes to uh, your setup tuning? Basically, you want the line to look like, okay, none of these laps uh, look right. So what I'll do is um, try and find uh, an online example, perhaps. Uh, so one moment. Um, so we transition here. So now we're in Chrome. 
So let's have a look at, let's say, ideal histogram or uh, damper histogram. So uh, Google is your friend. <laughs> um, so basically, let's have a look here. So yeah, this is this is a nice graph here. And so this is for motorcycles, but yeah, still applies to cars, still relevant. That's how you want your histogram to look, basically. So you want it symmetrical, both in bump and rebound. And if you look here, hopefully, I'm not sure if you can see my my mouse, but hopefully you can. But if you look outside of the, the blue bars anyway, this blue section, um, you want this line to flatten out, these, this red line to flatten out as you go further out. Um, so if it doesn't, then there is undampened forces in the suspension, and that's not good at all. So, um, yeah, so basically, go back to Motec here. So you want, you want your damper histograms to look the way that picture looks. So in this case, this is the default aggressive and it's, yeah, it's off, it's unbalanced. And uh, something to kind of give you a little further insight about, okay, so it doesn't look right, what do I change? So you have the, you have these percentage values. So this shows the percentage of time spent in um, rebound, or um, bump, also known as compression and extension damping, if you want. That's an, another phrase for it, but in racing, they're commonly called bump and rebound. So in this case, if I just look here, um, so hopefully I'm just gonna try and, yeah, so there we have just a bigger view. If you look here on the top left, or the front left rather, and the top left, that it's the in the slow damping the uh, front left damper is spending 38.9 percent of the time in rebound while it's only at 33.9 percent in the bump in the case of the slow damping so it's spending a lot more time in the rebound so that's showing and um, basically the stiffer the damper the higher this value will be because the damper is moving a little bit slower. So um, there's a little bit more time spent. That's as far as I understand it. Um, and then, yeah, and the bump is very low. So in the situation of this case, or in this situation, you have two options. You can either soften the rebound. Um, now the number of clicks, I don't know, and it'll vary from car to car. But let's say, for example, so there's a difference of 5% between the rebound and bump, decrease the uh, slower rebound on the front left by five clicks. Let's say, but it's not perfect. It does vary from car to car. So you'll have to do a little bit of experimentation and it's a little bit frustrating, but all I can say for sure anyway, is that you can, you'll need to decrease your rebound or you can increase your bump. It's probably better actually just looking at the shape, it's probably better to stiffen the bump because the line is a little bit smoother going down towards the rebound here as opposed to the bump. There's this little spike. So it may be better to um, stiffen up the slow bump. Um, and then in the case then, uh, the fast damping, yeah, it's a little bit mismatched as well. So uh, again, stiffer fast bump would get it a bit more matched with the uh, fast rebound on the front left. And from a guide that I read, there's a guide um, a couple of years ago, I can't remember the exact source, but it was just a single page and you can look, 
maybe if I can find it, I can put up a link for it. But they were explaining that it's very difficult to have them exactly the same because of multiple factors, because of the characteristics of the uh, the track that you're driving on, the uh, suspension geometry of the car, uh, also the bumps and curbs <clears throat> on a different circuit. And the big thing as well, uh, uh, or big influencing factor is driving technique. So if you have someone who's driving into corners and they're whacking the curbs all over the place, they might need a completely different damper balance compared to someone who likes to drive around the curbs and very, very smooth and gentle with the car. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, I would say that it's not, you know, two damper or having the identical damper settings as another driver doesn't necessarily mean you have the identical graphs because driving style does influence, um, the histogram as well, as well as the, the damper velocities, which isn't here and I'll add to it. Um, I'll show you how you can add that information in. Uh, so, but the general rule of thumb from that guide I've read is that you want your percentages to be plus or minus 1% of each other. So in this case, this is 38.9 on the rebound, the slow rebound, you want your bump to either be, or be anywhere between 37.9% to 39.9%. So uh, if you want to kind of narrow that range again, you could always do that as well, if you like. So that way that there's complete, there's a balance um, between the bump and the rebound. And trust me, when you get the dampers nicely balanced, you feel it in the car and it drives much, much better. Um, that being said, that doesn't mean that that's all you do. And you're like, okay, your dampers are balanced, go and you're happy and you're ready to go. I would say that initial starting point is good to get them balanced. But further to that, you might actually want a slight imbalance in the damping uh, to change a little bit of the handling characteristics of the car in certain corners. So you might actually prefer to go for an Im slightly imbalanced dampers than fully balanced because of things such as, as well as aerodynamics as well, because the dampers, you know, affects basically the, uh, the frequency of the suspension, how fast the suspension loads up. Um, so if your dampers are very soft, so the weight transfers, or basically the car pitches very quickly, it squats really quickly, it rolls very quickly. All these factors can have uh, a very a de highly detrimental effect on the aero balance of the car. Um, whereas with stiff damping, you can maintain a better aero balance. Um, it's a bit easier to work with, basically. And the car is a bit more stable, a bit more predictable. Anyway, so that's histograms, basically. Um, I don't, like I said, I'm not an engineer, so I might not fully have certain concepts down. Uh, so, but that's, that's as far as I understand it at this point. Um, and from my experience, it seems to work when they're balanced at the very least. Um, so it's, it's good to aim for that. So that's how you can use the histograms for. We go into suspension travel. So this is, now I mentioned dampers. So dampers is what showcases your, um, the speed of the damp of, of how the speed of the suspension, how fast it moves up and down. The travel shows you the um, how much the suspension moves in millimeters. So I'm going to do something actually. Let's uh, create a new worksheet. This is all handy for uh, so you can see how you can do this kind of stuff as well. So we'll say this, we'll call it just suspension travel for now. And how can we create a more readable worksheet? Or actually is there, let me just check something here very quickly. Nope, they're all in the one group, okay. So in MoTeC, if you wanted to add a graph, you right click anywhere in this uh, checkered space. Add, <clears throat> in this case, we want a time distance graph. And 
I'm going to add two groups for now. And then I'll show you what I can do after that. And we're going to add four elements to this because I want to show when the bump stops activate as well, which is kind of handy. So we have the left front. Yep, there we go. And what we'll do is then also put the left front travel with the left front bump stop, the left rear travel with the left rear bump stop. Remove that. Okay, there we go. So that's one side of the car. So let's just... Uh, so uh, 1568 divided by 2 is 784. Okay. So I like my, th you know, sort of uh, uh, my uh, graphs to be sort of symmetrical and all that. So you don't have to do that. You can always just do it by feel if you like, but I like to do it that way. And paste. So now we have two of these. And then with this side, we're going to look at the right front and right rear. Nope, not a group, not a channel. So we want the right front, the right rear bump stops. We want the right front and the right rear wheel tra suspension travel. So we'll move that up, move this down. There we go. So let's get different colors for each of the rear wheels or the front right. So yeah, if you wanted to change the color of the graph, you just basically so you right click on any of these graphs, properties, double click on the channel, then you can assign a color. So I like to assign this to be red and the right rear can stay at cyan color. And for the left front, we'll set that to orange and the travel for the left rear to pink. So basically this is the same as this, except it's not just a jumbled up mess of lines. So it's the exact same information, but nicely separated. So it's a little bit more easier to read. Um, and one thing I'll do as well is we'll display the measurements to see average values as well as, uh, sorry, let me just change the order of these things a little bit. And that as well. There we go. So, and this is only showing down to the millimeter. So we wanted to show a little bit finer than that. So how do you do that? Go to channel editor and where's suspension travel? So there it is. And decimal places, so we'll say two We'll have that two, that two as well, and that two as well. There we go. Now we have it down to the hundredth of a millimeter. Some people might think that's a bit too much, but <laughs> might be just happy with the sort of whole numbers. But if you want a little bit more granularity, that's all. Uh, it's handy to. Um, you can, you can edit, not, doesn't work for all the channels, but at least for suspension travel, you do have that granularity there. I think actually, how far does it go down? I think it actually can go down all the way to like a ridiculous value. And uh, when I saw that, it made me think, wow, the, the <laughs> everything's to a really, 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 really fine number in uh, ACC. So that's 15 number. Yeah, so if you look at that, maximize, it goes down to 15 digits. Pretty nuts, really nuts. But we don't need that much. <laughs> at least I don't need that much. 
And I don't think many people need that much, as far as I know. But it's there. If you want that uh, detail, it's there. Uh, so basically, the suspension travel shows, and actually, let's. Uh, Actually, I'm going to just do something here. So, 876 divided by 2 is what? 800, 400, 76 is 33. So, 433, I think. No, 438. Yeah, 438. Pretty sure that's right. Uh, yes, okay, quite pleased with that. But anyway, <laughs> um, so when you look at a lot of telemetry and you kind of have, and you do a lot of sim racing and a lot of long running, you have to be good with the mental arithmetic. It's it's quite important to be able to calculate strategy decisions and all of that kind of stuff. So what I'm going to do here is put in throttle and brake. Where is the brake? There is the brake. And we'll put them in separate groups like that. There we go. So now we have the throttle and brake. So why am I showing this? Because it's kind of relevant to understanding what's happening with the suspension of the car. So in this case, um, so we have the travel here, pretty neutral at this point. But notice when I start braking for turn one, the front spikes up, particularly the front left. The front right, not so much, because I think yeah, I'm turning. So actually, let's see if we can get steering as well. So where's steering? There it is. So at this point when I'm braking, yeah, I'm starting to turn already. So that's why the front right isn't really changing or it's going down rather than up because the car is rolling in the corner. So basically, look, if you look at just focus on the top left here, the left front, you'll notice that when I'm braking and turning, it spikes up. And that's because the front suspension is compressing. So the front is moving. So where, where did it sort of start on, down the straight? So it's about 20, 21. So it goes up roughly 20 millimeters. So just under braking goes back 20 millimeters. And also something of note is to look at the activation for the bump stop. So you can see here, um, now a lot of the cars by default in ACC um the front we the front suspension is pretty much like zero let's say coil spring travel um but uh so you ride the bump stops almost instantly and if you're going at any sort of speed you're just sitting on the front bump stops all the time uh which is a little bit weird from because when i was I started out kind of racing a lot of single seaters and the general rule was yes ride the bump stops but at the when you're at your top speed and maybe you ride the front bump stops under braking but as you start turning in you want to be coming off the bump stops ACC is a little bit different and the bump stop sort of uh, principle is a little bit different so um, something that um, someone uh, told me actually um, it's quite useful. A good way to imagine bump stops um, is uh, imagining it as a third spring. So I won't go into the detail of all of that, but uh, you know, just to control the pitch and squat of the car a little bit. So that's what the third spring is in Formula One cars and LMP1 cars. LMP2 might have them as well. I'm not sure. Um, but you have heave, or another word for them is heave springs as well. So that's that's a way that you can use those. So the bump stops for GT3s can sort of be 
imagined a little bit like heave springs, but they're not quite the same because uh, they're a lot stiffer than heave springs. But anyway, so you'll see here the front left compresses and the rear left sort of goes up a little bit. Now, this is kind of an interesting characteristic about the Ferrari. The rear doesn't change very much under bump. This is a characteristic of the Ferrari exclusively. I haven't found any other GT3 car that behaves in this way and it's quite puzzling and it's not a bump stop thing because you can see here the bump stop's not activating at all. So there's some sort of wizardry or witchcraft going on with the Ferrari's rear suspension that I haven't figured out yet. But let's see, uh, it does change under, when does it change? So it changes under roll, that's for sure. I think it's changing under roll. Yeah, so I think I'm turning the other way. And yeah, so you can see that the suspension goes down under roll. Pretty much, yeah, you know, uh, doesn't change very much under load. It's kind of interesting behavior of the Ferrari. Anyway, so basically <clears throat> when the line goes up, that's the suspension compressing or the suspension going into bump. And when the line goes down or when the graphs go down, that's the suspension going into rebound, basically. That's a way of imagining that. And even if you look at uh, this part of the uh, lap here, you can see the front bump stop, the left front is not activating at all. So, um, that's kind of a sign as well that the front's lifting. And why is that happening? Because uh, I think, yeah, basically I've, the speed I think has dropped considerably. So there's less strain or less force being put on the front tires, I think. And am I accelerating? Yep. yep. So basically you'll see that under braking, it spikes up under acceleration it goes down, at least for the front. The opposite can happen with the rear of the car. So under braking, it, the rear suspension would go into rebound and under acceleration would go into bump or compression. Um, so that's, that's how all that works. So how is this information useful? Well, this information is useful for determining how much your suspension is moving essentially so on average over the course of this lap this is just the default aggressive preset setup the suspension is moving 19.49 millimeters over the course of the lap and for some people that might be moving too much for other people maybe it's not moving enough so this kind of information is useful to know if you want to change particularly your wheel rates, your bump stop rates, as well as your uh, bump stop gap as well. So, um, sure, Bobby, no problem at all, man. No problem. Yeah, it's a little bit of a long one tonight. So it should be around and I'll, uh, I'll export it to YouTube as well. So it'll be there forever and ever. So I'll be able to rewatch it if you want at a, at a later point. So it should be there. Um, so yeah, uh, so you can determine your wheel rates as well as your roll bars as well, actually and bump stops. So those three factors would influence what happens with this graph. So if you have softer wheel rates and suspensions, you know, there's higher amplitude of, of movement in bump and rebound. So you'll find uh, you'll have much higher numbers. And if you look actually at the rear, I can, it's a good example. Usually cars are set up to be softer at the rear than at the front. 
So if you look at the rear travel, it's traveling up to 52 millimeters on the rear left, while the front's only going up to 40. So there's a 12 millimeter difference uh, in peak, but also something of note is the average travel. So you can see that the rear left is traveling 32 millimeters or 32.7 mill millimeters um, over the course of the lap. So uh, it's traveling a lot more than the front left and it should be the yep and it's the same for the front right as well front right and the rear right same thing so this information is is kind of handy to know for like i said for tuning your wheel rates for tuning your bump stops for tuning your uh, uh, roll bars as well uh, if you see a big difference in the difference of roll between the front left and the front right, that might be that your roll, front roll bar is too soft. Um, and the same applies for the rear as well. If you see a big difference in travel between the rear left and the rear right, then your roll bars are too soft. Um, so you might want to get them a bit more balanced um, in that case. So. I'm going to be back in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to get a drink because my I've been talking for a very long time. <laughs> so I'm just going to go get a drink and I'll be back very shortly. So I shall see you soon.
And I'm back. So, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so basically, yeah, that's the, uh, the suspension trouble. So that's how I can use that information. So now the next bit, that's the kind of interesting. And uh, that would be kind of nice uh, or that we can add to this is we're going to add a new workbook. And I'm going to name this workbook because this is a critical element, tires. So, and I'll rename this worksheet. So you can right click on the worksheet and rename it to tire. So we'll call this tire pressures. That's very important. And I'm going to create another worksheet called tire temperatures. And is there another tire thing? As far as I know, that'll do for now. So again, what we can do is just show you what we can uh, right click here, click add or hover over add, time and distance graph. And I'm going to add two groups and we're going to add the tire pressure stuff. So we have the left front, the left rear, and move that down. Change the color coding. To uh, that. And then we're going to make that. What did I say? 734 was it? 1576 divided by seven? No. And what was it? 1568, okay, 784. All right, and then what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna, you can right click on any of these graphs and if you want to just make a copy of them, just copy, paste, that's it. Control C, Control V. If you've used Microsoft Word, if you've used any program with software, with uh, that kind of stuff, it's pretty straightforward. And on this one, we're going to change that to the right front and the right rear. So again, you can go here and here. Move that up. That's already the right colors. And one thing I'm going to do, so you can see some huge variance. You can also manually define the scale you want. So instead of having the channel to auto scale, some things that's okay. You might want to use it that way. But um, personally, for tire pressures, I have lines to look less erratic. So I set this to a manual scale and let's set that to, let's say uh, 26 and 30. And we'll set this to 26 and that to 30. There we go. So now the lines look a little bit more flat. Um, and we have to do the same for the other side. Why is that really high? That shouldn't be so high. Oh, that's temp. That's air to all. Oh, right. Okay. I had loaded the wrong channels. Um, so we we'll need to change that. So how can we? We can click remove, click remove, add channel. So we want pressure, not temperature. We'll, we'll get into temperature in a little bit. There we go. So this is showing the tire pressure over the course of the lap. Measurements, show the measurements for that as well. And again, we'll need to go at least we'll go to channel editor because this is showing whole numbers. So we want that to show 
down to the hundredth of a pound. That is important for pressures. There we go. So now we have it to the hundredth of a pound. So if you remember, if anyone was tuning in from the start of the stream, I mentioned about doing two laps specifically and not just the one. And why is that? Because of this. If we look here, so one thing you can do actually is select multiple laps. So the pressures basically take up to two laps to sort of um, rest or build up, yeah, build up to the correct pressure. So that's why I did three laps and I always recommend people when they're ever doing any sort of pressure tuning uh, or trying to get their pressures right, you really should do at least three laps and three laps where you are driving consistently and smoothly, not necessarily going qualifying laps every lap, but that you're driving smoothly and consistently throughout the three laps. So you have your out lap and your two hot laps. And in this case, so this is the first graph that I look at when I first go on the track. Tire pressures is the first thing that you should adjust really when it comes to setting up the car. So there's a bit of debate about what's the optimal pressures, what numbers you should go for. Some people strongly believe that you should always aim for 27.5 pressures. Uh, other people are a little bit more relaxed about it and believe that it should be anywhere between 27.5 and 28.5. Uh, so it's, you know, it's personal preference what people prefer when it comes to all of that kind of stuff. Personally, <clears throat> I'm of the school that I like it around 28 PSI. And is that 28 peak, 28 minimum? No, it's average. So the real main number that you need to look at is the average. That's what I use for reference personally. So you really don't need to go necessarily into your peak pressure, your minimum pressure. So on this run, in this case, the minimum pressure for the front left is 26.7, four for the, uh, and the peak was at 27.39. And uh, works out at an average of 27.1 for the front left, 27.1 for the front right, 27 for the rear left, and 27.15 for the rear right. So in this case, I would say that I'm about 0.8 of a pound too low uh, for the front pressures at least, maybe 0.9 of a pound. Um, so you want to have your pressures, or I would, in this case, I would want to increase my pressures uh, a little bit beyond what they are right now. And the rear needs a little bit more, particularly the rear left as well. So that's how you can use this information. Very basic, very, 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 very straightforward. You know, you have a minimum, you have a maximum, but the real, the only, the number you should really only really care about is the average. That's what I care about because over the course of a lap, when you're going into particularly higher speed corners, it's natural for the pressures to rise uh, quite a bit. Um, and in lower speed corners, it's natural for them to sort of dip a little as well. So. Uh, you'll never, they'll never ever hold at a particular number, but you just want the average to be at a certain range or a certain value um, as you like. One thing I'm going to do actually, I'm just going to delete this worksheet because we can save a bit of time by just doing this. So just right click on a worksheet, duplicate, boom. And uh, we'll rename this to temperatures. So, okay, I don't need the gloves. I don't know why I'm wearing the gloves right now. Uh, <laughs> so we'll add the tire temp air for the left front and the left rear. We don't need the pressures. 
And yeah, this is where we're going to need. So for the scaling for this, we'll change it a little bit. So we'll say 60 and 100 and 60 and 100. There we go. And the same for the right side tires. And we'll need to change that from pressures to temperature. And if you all, you could always, if you wanted as well, you could always have it so that you have the pressures and the temperature. So you could do it like that. Well, okay, now the pressure value is not showing because of the scaling, but you could always do that if you wanted. Uh, whoa, oh, removed the wrong one. <laughs> it's 1 a.m. here, so pardon the slight mishaps. But there we go. So this is temperature now. So <clears throat> for temperatures, particularly with the dry tires, you want them to be like the slicks. You want the temperatures be to be between 70 and 90 degrees Celsius. So that's the optimal, or that's the working range of the slick tires. If you want to be a bit more finite about it, you could say between 75 and 85 if you wanted. Um, or 80, exactly 80. So 80 is probably the perfect temperature, but it, the tire still works quite well between 70 and 90. So in this case, this is a good way of determining is your tire temperature is going way high or way low. And in this case, the left side tires are kind of Okay, and this is interesting actually. So this is, was this the lap that I had? Yeah, this was the lap where I had that massive oversteer moment in the 130R. And look at the right rear. Right rear is here, the cyan colored line and just goes, whoop, it just starts rising quite a bit because of that big slide I had in the 130R. So, that's why I was mentioning again about driving consistently and smoothly, because that kind of information can skew your telemetry data. So in this case, the temperature went a little bit above, not too much above, so 93 is not too bad. And probably if I drove smoothly on the next lap, it wouldn't go as high as 93. Um, but yeah, so temperatures could safely say they're okay, just about, they're on the limit, but just about okay. So rear left's peaking at 90, um, but the other tires are the front left, the front right's okay. And this does have a relationship with pressures as well. So like I said, my pressures are, in my opinion, under what they should be. So if I increase the pressures, these numbers will go down as well. So with higher pressures, probably won't be a concern at all when it comes to tire temperature. So that's tires, pretty much. That's the two things I'm trying to, let me just try and see here. Um, if there, I don't think there's anything else in regards to tire information. There is not. So you just have temperature. This is core temperature, mind you, not surface. Surface temperatures, you have to do it the old fashioned way of going for a few laps, coming back in the pits and um, basically looking at the inner, middle, outer readings when you're in the pits, um, as well as, and then you know, that can tell you a little bit of information about your camber values, your toe values, uh, caster, um, uh, as well as tire wear. Tire wear is a very good indicator about all of that kind of information. <clears throat> so now one other workbook that would be good to have is brake temperatures. So if we go here, brakes, and actually, can I just duplicate the workbook? Oh, okay. 
opportunity missed there, Otec. Uh, layout editor. Oh, okay, never mind. So we'll have to edit add these. But actually, I think I can just copy these. I can just copy this and put in the next workbook. Oh yes, it works. Paste that as well. And then for this one, <clears throat> we'll add the brake temperatures. So you have left front, left rear. And we'll have to adjust the scaling, of course, for that as well. Right front, right rear. So we'll set the scaling for this to be much higher. So we'll say 200 to 700. And the same for the left side. All right, there we go. So brake temperatures, again, like pressures and tire temperatures, although probably they're a bit more erratic than tire temperatures. They are more erratic actually, uh, will vary over the course of a lap. So naturally you will find that the front brake temperatures get way hotter than the rear brake temperatures. That's normal behavior, uh, nothing abnormal with that. But the key thing to note from this, from these graphs is basically are similar to tire temperatures, are your brakes in their working temperature? Um, so if you have your brake ducts far too open, so the brakes are getting a lot of air, they're gonna cool down a lot more and it's likely that they might go to below their operating temperature. Conversely, if your brake ducts are too narrow and your brake temperatures get too high, then they're going to overheat and you're going to lose braking performance. So in terms of the numbers, what numbers you should go for when it comes to brake temperatures, generally speaking, I would say uh, probably anywhere between uh, 400 and 700 degrees Celsius. That'll probably be a good range to aim for when it comes to your brake temperatures. There was something I was going to do, um, but I haven't done it, but I should do it, which is basically, if you want to figure out what's your optimal tire temperatures, your optimal brake temperatures, if you go into hot lap mode in ACC, every time you start a new lap, your brake temperatures and your tire temperatures reset to the optimal values. And I'm pretty sure when it comes to the brakes, it's around 400, the tires is 80. So um, that's a good way of trying to get information out of ACC. Um, one thing, but one thing anyway, the main thing to really kind of keep in mind when it comes to the brake temperatures, you really don't want the brake temperatures peaking. That's the maximum value here to go higher than 650, 700. 700 is probably the absolute limit. And you'll notice that when you're driving an ACC, an audio cue that you can uh, listen for when your brakes are overheating is they whistle. So if you have your brake ducts, you know, you can just test it, you know, go to Monza, take your front or your brake ducts front and rear down to zero. So the fully, pretty much like fully shut brake ducts and go full chat into the first chicane, break as late as you can. And you'll hear towards the end of the braking zone, just this whistling noise in the background. Um, and if you look at the little graphic in the bottom right, uh, you can see the, uh, the brakes changing to that orangey or even red color. Uh, that's not, that's a very bad sign. So that's a sign that you need to open up your brake ducts. So just let me rename this worksheet. There we go. 
And what else? Uh, I'll just have a look here. Um, see what information that we can gather. I'm pretty sure that's most, well, that's pr primarily the useful information. Oh, right, yes, suspension. So one thing that we'll do is we shall uh, call this uh, damper velocities. So this these graphs are very useful for uh, tweaking your fast dampers in particular. And these are the ones you need. These are the channels you need. So this is the front left and rear left. Move the front left up there, the rear left up here. Take away the pressures. And I'm just going to auto scale this for now. And the same for the other side. Uh, oh, right, that's why. All right, so <clears throat> damper velocities. So this information, basically, uh, the damper velocities is simply, and let's see if we can look at the equation. I think we can look at the equation here. because It comes built in with MoTeC. Um, no, we cannot. Okay. Well, basically, yeah. If you have any sort of uh, sort of a little bit of understanding of uh, something known as derivatives, so it's basically how the suspension moves over time, that's in millimeters per second, um, over the course of the lap. And the derivative, as far as I understand it, is to do with, uh, you know, if you have your base point is zero, uh, and then it's looking at the values beyond, above and below zero. So in the case of uh, dampers, this kind of information is useful to know, particularly with the fast damping. So if we look here, so this is one lap, this is the first lap. So here you can see these massive spikes happening with the damper velocities. So where is this happening? Infinitely approaching zero, right? Yeah, thanks Horatio. So, uh, that's that's a good way of uh, yeah yeah sort of yeah like I said I'm not an engineer and this is my maths isn't you know really really solid but I have some understanding but yeah that's a good way of describing it so I think I think <laughs> um, so basically you know the car is okay you know we're going down the straight here. Not very much is happening, not, and then probably have hit a curb here or there. Um, but then you see these, uh... yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, like I said, it's, I didn't really do advanced mathematics back in the day. So it's something I would like to improve, though. Um, and uh, definitely when I'm done with studies and stuff, it's something I'd like to kind of get a bit more into. Uh, but basically, uh, if you want to kind of think in layman's terms when it comes to these velocities, so these big spikes signify hard impacts with curbs, with bumps. And if you see these massive jolts, so let's try, I'm trying to see here where's a problematic jolt. 
so yeah initially i might be, yeah on this lap i can say that my um wait no that's when i had the big oversteer moment not good um just yeah quickly glancing over here i can definitely see that you'll notice that there's a lot more upward spikes than there are downward spikes or that they are higher values than the downward spikes and that's a sign of the front fast dampers particularly for the front left maybe being a little bit too soft so there's high velocities going on here with the dampers so you'd want to tighten up the fast the front the front fast dampers a little bit to mute those velocities a little bit um, that being said things look a little bit oh is this because of yeah this is because of the auto scaling so if i do this okay so if you overlay yeah and then this is you could compare as well damper set you know damper velocities between different runs uh, where you maybe ran a certain certain fast damper adjustment and you can sort of compare straight away you know the differences between the uh the setup changes between two different runs so um one thing i will do actually is let's rename this workbook to suspension that's your suspension suspension okay and I'm going to move this histogram. So let's say, yeah, we'll move. So this is, yeah, this is a good uh, way to, so let's say there's graphs in one workbook that I want in another one. So I have a suspension workbook that I've set up. So I want to move those two. We can't move both at the same time. Okay, never mind. Um, we want to move it to, suspension uh, workbook so we have the travel and the histogram and we'll put that travel as there there as well why not all right so now if i go to the suspension workbook there, there we go now we have all the suspension stuff in the one workbook we can look at the histogram, we can look at the travel. And what I'll do actually, um, we'll just remove this stuff for now. I don't need this stuff. And delete that. And move these down so we have a bigger scale of them. And yeah, these are also actually auto scaled so let's try and manually scale these so we'll say zero definitely be the midpoint for me or the minimum point and we'll set this to 60 set the size to 50 and we'll say this scaling zero and we'll be a little bit more generous with the rear suspension ranges. And the same for the other side. I think what I said 60, I think. I'll double check that now. Yep, okay. You can also actually as well define the size of each individual section. So let's say, just for the sake of example, we'll make this 75, so that's 75%, and make this 25. This happens, if you wanted it that way. So that way you can have one of the graphs a little bit smaller while the other one's a bit larger. But if you wanted just to have it a balanced, and you have two values, you can just set it to 
50 and 50. So that way they uh, take equal amount of screen space. And there you go. So what was I going to do? So yeah, let's, so a lot, a lot of talking. So what I'm going to do now is actually just demonstrate a little bit about how then I go about, so, you know, using the telemetry. So basically the way I go about it is, um, so we'll transition that. Um, the way I go about it is uh, drive for a few laps, go back to the pits, look at the graphs, drive for a few laps. So if you haven't followed my streams from before, you'll see that kind of, uh, that's how I've been going about. Um, so we'll just leave that as it is. Or actually, yeah. So like I said, if we look back uh, quickly, so I'm just going to, I don't have screen capture anymore, but this is how I usually do things. Uh, so the first thing we look at is pressures. So like I said, so it's 0.9, I say 0.9 of a pound too low, front left, front right, rear left, rear right. So we'll increase that a little bit. So that's 25.9, set that to 26.8, uh, 26.6, 26.3, and 26.5. And yeah, like I was mentioning actually as well, uh, okay, and f yeah. So basically when it comes to camber, toe, caster, these are the values you need to look at in game. You have the outer, middle, and inside of each tire. Inner, middle, outer, inner, middle, outer, uh, outer, middle, inner. So the inside number here is your the inside surface temperature. The, out, the middle is the middle temperature, and the outer is the outside surface temperature. And you also have tire wear. So over an extended run, you might want to determine is your tire wear balanced across the surface of the tire? Uh, and what's, and you can also compare the tire wear front to rear as well. So in the example, I did three laps the last time and already there is a little bit of imbalance in tire wear between front to rear, but uh, roughly an imbalance of 0 0.02 to 0 0.03 of a millimeter which doesn't sound like much, but over a very, over a long run, uh, like an hour long run that can, uh, exponentially grow to, uh, 0.3 of a millimeter, 0.4, if you're really ragged with the car. So it's important to, um, try and get them balanced, particularly for long runs. I believe in that personally. Fuel as well. It'd be nice actually if we could have that in telemetry. I don't think that's private information really, <laughs> or kind of NDA style information. I don't think. But uh, fuel, same, you know, same way you usually do it. It's just through uh, reading the number here and determining how much fuel you need, right? So that's pretty much it. Anyway, so let's, and this is where I saw about brake ducts as well. So, you know, tighten up the brake ducts. Actually, yeah, let me see here quickly. What were my brake temperatures like? So we have a look here at the temperatures. So I have a bit of headroom with the front, plenty of headroom for the rear brakes. That being said, there is heat transfer from the brakes to the tires. So these numbers might go way up as well. So it's important to find a nice balance between the brake temperature and the tire temperature as well. Um, so you don't want, you could have great working brakes, but if your tires are hovering around 100 degrees Celsius, uh, 
<laughs> you can break late into a corner, but then there's the corner itself, and then you're sliding, and then it's, yeah, so big mess. So I'll take these down just a click for now. And we did change temperatures already. And I am on a fresh set. Yes, OK. And we'll just do a couple of laps. Make sure, actually, the game audio is not showing. Yes, now it is. And transition, there we go. I at least remember it this time. Already, I can notice that the uh, pressures have gone up from what they were before, and uh, the brakes as well, they're staying more in the green than they were previously. One thing I'm going to do actually is increase the slip limitation on the trash control. Just a little bit. Nope. So already now my pressures are much closer where they should be. But again, I'll verify with telemetry. Hopefully we should see an improve an improvement in lap time from the previous run. So I was about mid 201s, mid to high 201s. So let's see what the lap time reads here in this run. Actually, yeah, I'll dial the trash control down to make sure it doesn't influence the lap time. So I think it is quicker with a little bit, at least in these conditions and the way the car is currently set up. But uh, something I'll change maybe on the next run. So low 201 there, one more.
that's a little nice. Massive improvement. Massive improvement. Over the previous run. Now, I'm not sure if that's because I'm driving better, smoother than I was in the last run, or the setup is uh, working as it should. But uh, I would lean more towards the setup because it's quite late and I'm a little bit tired. So, <laughs> um, oh, yes, this is a very good example of how stuff breaks sometimes in ACC. So because I haven't been driving for ages, this can happen. So the data from that last run is nothing, or it's there, but yeah, it's a complete mess. And yeah, so that can break sometimes. Not really sure why that happens. It's a programming thing, I think. So what I'll do is um, I think I'll, I need to restart the session essentially. But I'm just going to save this um, as uh, MoTeC demo. So I do have some other setups but, that I worked on. But actually I can look, I think the pressures were going way up at the front in particular. So we'll take that down a couple of clicks. And save. So we'll go out, go back in, and then everything should work again, as it should. Weird problem, don't get it. But it's there. It happens sometimes. Maybe it's Kunos's way of trying to say less talking, more driving, please. <laughs> A hidden way of saying it. All right. So try that again. Green light. Give it all you got. Have a look here, just out of curiosity. Nope. Well, maybe the temperatures were way down. They are a little bit lower than the default clear temperatures. It's a little bit cloudy as well. Just lower air temperature. Definitely that'll boost lap time itself, but the conditions of the last run were exactly the same as this run, pretty much, so conditions are the same, so the shouldn't, uh, should be ultimately set up and driving would dictate whether or not things have improved or not. things a bit more interesting so you can see the steering wheel I usually drive in the dash cam but anyway
hesitant on the throttle there. A little bit hesitant there too. Now if I look at temperatures, they're okay. That's oh. all good. All good. <laughs> That's what happened to me on my second hot lap. Going through the 130R. You hit that inside curb just a little. Yeah, if you just hit it just wrong. Anyway, so definitely a little bit more lap time there. But yeah, with the Ferrari, it's quite handy. You can also see the temperatures there. It's a little bit hard to read because white on a bright green background yeah, doesn't work. But you can also see the temperatures in real time if you wanted. The Lamborghini as well and the Audi have a real time display. Um, so if we put it in this so you can have you can cycle through the Motec displays. The Ferrari has three. So what's what's of important of note here is just below the D1 section you have a live readout of pressures. Um, <clears throat> but you also have it as well of course in the on-screen graphic in the HUD. Here you have water temperature I think. Uh, Fuel pressure, I think. Oil temperature. Battery voltage, perhaps. And oil pressure, I think. Yes. Yeah, so. Oh, yeah, something interesting. Yeah, this graph, so you'll notice some cars have this. Uh, so you'll notice when I hit the brake pedal here, it's showing the balance. 
So there's a value here below that uh, differ difference graph or the difference uh, panel. It is you can see a real time display of your brake front to rear brake uh, pressure, I guess. So it's 4.9 maybe that's a measurement of the pads how much the pads have worn but that's handy in a long distance race to determine you know are your pads worn or not because those values will change over time anyway uh, so we'll go return to garage uh, so obviously because I was sitting in the pits for it yeah so those values are worthless um, but now if we go back into Motec so Hopefully the data now is showing properly. Yep, there we go. That's nice. So this is temperatures. Uh, so, yep, temperatures are okay. So no problem there. And pressures. There we have. So pressures are a lot closer where I want them to be but maybe a little too high on the rear left and maybe a little needs a little bit more on the front right <coughs> excuse me and the rear right and then if we look at brakes as well the brake temperature sort of changed a little so it was uh, 599 603 and on that last run now there it's about 630 peak and uh, I think, yeah, much higher average, or is it not much higher, but a little bit higher average as well. And the rear is peaking at 311, 319. So there's still more headroom with the front brakes and the rear brakes. Um, and yeah, so something I want, so the reason why before I restarted the session, I decreased the front uh, pressures. And what you can see, that's it's prevalent now in the rear pressures. So had I not changed the brake duct size, I'd say my pressures would probably be quite okay, at least for the left side. Uh, but because I tighten up the brake ducts, now there's more brake temperature. Now there's more tire temperature. Now there's more tire pressure. So they're all intertwined. So it's important that, you know, when you go for a run, you make a setup, make a setup change, particularly with the brake ducts and the tire pressures, um, that you, uh, you know, validate or, you know, verify that your pressures are still where they should be. Um, the two primary influencing factors are pressures and brakes, in my experience. Suspension obviously can have an effect, but in my experience, not uh, nowhere near as much as brake temperatures and tire pressures. That's my personal opinion. Um, but already, anyway, I can see from that last run, my pressures are a little bit too high on the rear left. Um, and a little bit too low on the right side. So what we'll do is increase, uh, so decrease the rear or the left side or the rear left uh, three clicks, the front left one click, I think, front right two clicks, the rear right say three clicks and two clicks and we'll leave the brakes as they are for this for now and we'll go with brake pads one or no keep things the same Hopefully, they should be where they should, the pressures should uh, 
be at that 28 mark. I've noticed that <clears throat> there's one thing, one other thing I'll change on the setup before the next run is the rear end is a little bit oversteery, particularly on a throttle coming out of slower corners like the uh, chicane here, and the hairpin a little bit maybe, but particularly through the second spoon curve. So something to try with the setup there.
Ah, so close. So close. So close. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, um, so, pretty sure the pressures are just very, very close to perfect now. They're very close to where I want them personally. Um, so, if we do okay. And bingo. There we go. So, rear right maybe a little needs a pound less, maybe. But pretty much where I want them to be 28. Just a little bit under, tiny bit under, or a little bit over for the front right. But very, very close where, it's, where I'd like it to be. So I mentioned as well that there's one thing that I'd like to change about the car. Which is the rear suspension. So I feel that I'm getting a little bit of oversteer in the second, particularly going into the second uh, the second spoon curve probably noticed it a bit or a little bit of uh, sliding going into there so that's a problem at the moment and I think some more lap time can come out of that so we'll try one more thing and I realized this stream has gone on for two and a half hours very long one tonight I talk too much uh, <laughs> so let's see how can we improve that so like I said so what I'll do is I'll try this might not work but I'll try this I'll do one click uh, less on the rear wheel rates and take that down a pound or point one of a pound and try this so this might not work simply because Ferrari has arrow is quite important on the Ferrari by softening the rear suspension a little bit that might throw it out of whack like the, uh, the rear diffuser but we'll see it might be a rear roll bar problem that's uh, potentially possible as well but see how it is here Felt okay there. Should get a bit more traction out of the hairpin as well. Yep. A lot more. Moment of truth. Almost understeers there actually. Give it two more laps. Get the pressures up and temperatures all of that. Definitely a lot of time can be gained through the 130R with some aero tuning.
not this one, maybe the next one. Nine seven three, so just about, but it's there. So, yeah. Um, if we have a look at the telemetry, which is this will be the last time I'll look at it, and then uh, I'll probably end the stream there. So, if we look here at the travel, so that was the last run. So, 62, if we look at the peak, uh, 61, 79, say 62 for the rear left. And, okay, the peak hasn't changed that much. <laughs> uh, but if we look at the average travel, that has increased. So if we compare the two, see if we can maximize this. So where can we notice it mostly? It's tricky, tricky to see this actually. Let's try where Spoon. Spoon is there. Okay. So that was the problem corner from... So ironically, even, <laughs> or funnily enough, I've softened it. It felt better, grippier through Spoon. But it felt almost understeery through there as well. So it's kind of a struggle to get the car to, to, to rotate. Um, so I had to kind of change my braking a little bit. So if we yeah, compare these two, so it's really hard to see. But yeah, barely can see it. Very, very small differences. But it is traveling a little bit more. So even if you look, let's see if we change the color. So even if you look from sort of a little bit generally, so ignoring the numbers, you'll see that the green line is that little bit higher almost all the way through. Sometimes it's exactly the same. But generally speaking, it's traveling that little bit more than the cyan colored line. So that's a demonstration of softer wheel rates, increased travel. So there you have it. 
front shouldn't have changed that much. Yep. I'll ignore the front for now because that curb where's let's try and find where's Degner. There's Degner, I think. Doesn't like the inside curb at all at Degner. So I think, yeah, that big spike, where is that big spike happening? That's happening in Dunlop, is it? No, okay. But yeah, that's Degner there. This is the left front. I thought, would have thought the right front would have been the one jolted the most, but anyway, there you go. <laughs> big jolt. And if we look at the velocities, it, yep. So, same for the velocities. So, big jolt. And yeah, particularly the rear left. Look at the rear left there and the rear right. Massive spike. It's going up to 900 uh, millimeters per, per second in that moment. So if we just zoom in here a little bit. Yeah, that's a serious amount of force going on there. And that's why when I hit the curb at Degner, the first Degner, you see, you know, it's a good thing I had the steering wheel there enabled. You could see me having to go really have to go opposite lock through there because of the big uh, jolt in the suspension. So it destabilized the car quite a bit. So that needs some work with damping, wheel rates, that kind of stuff. First, one thing I will actually mention, uh, because some people, they don't know where to start when it comes to suspension tuning. You do your travel. So we're, let's go back to AC. You do this stuff first, and then you do this stuff. Not this stuff, and then that stuff. That's really important. So you want to make sure that you get your wheel rates, your roll bars, bump stops, uh, yeah, probably. Um, bump stop range and your bump stop travel, or bump stop range and bump stop rate, you probably want to tune those. Um, maybe first as well, not too sure. That's more aero. But my general setup methodology is tires, uh, brakes, aero, so, you know, uh, ride height or wing, depending on what's the problem with the car, aero-wise. Aero is the only thing probably that I judge mainly on feel. And uh, there's a good corner at Suzuka to judge for aero is the 130R. Brilliant corner to judge for aero, as well as the spoon curves, turn one probably a little bit and the S-curves as well. So Suzuka is all about the downforce. Uh, so those, the majority of corners, but probably the 130R is a good benchmark to use for your aero balance uh, when it comes to your tuning. Uh, there's probably ways through telemetry and equations and stuff uh, to be able to set up your aero that way. Um, but, uh, for me, at least right now, I don't have that mathematical expertise, let's say, to get into that. But it'd probably be, uh, be good stuff to know. So there we have it. That's the... Uh, we'll mute that audio. Um, so volume mixer. Mute that. There we go. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you found it informative and uh, apologies for the length. Yeah, two hours and 46 minutes. Wow, very long stream. A lot longer than the ones I normally do uh, or that I try not to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you found it informative. Um, so there's a lot more stuff. It's a lot to take in for sure. Um, so uh, it can be a bit daunting 
but you know the first thing i would say for sure is that you know focus on your tire pressures or well get motec set up installed import the workspace um first thing create a workbook uh and the work and tire pressures and tire temperatures worksheets um because those are very important easy to understand but very important they're pretty much the core elements really when it comes to setup they're you know it's all about the tires as uh, i think danny gayusa the creator pro tires for the original set of courses he would say and i agree with that tires is a big component um brakes as well of course um, to ensure that your brakes are working in the correct temperature operating range but pressures brake temperatures tire temperatures those are the three primary components um so those kind of things hopefully should be pretty straightforward to get your head around it's i can definitely understand and empathize with people when it comes to damper velocities and suspension histograms and that stuff can be a little bit like whoa. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a maths guy. I have a r okay understanding of maths. Um, some basic kind of equations and stuff. And uh, I'm a programmer by uh, by trade, so you kind of have to know a little bit of maths with that. But I'm not an engineer. I'm not uh, uh, a statistician. St statistician. St Statistics guy, I'm not a statistics guy. So status, statistician, that's the word I was looking for. So, uh, or a mathematician. So uh, there's a lot more equations that are, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the one I was looking for. <laughs> so there's a lot more kind of equations and stuff and more complex stuff that you can use to get more useful information out of MoTeC, uh, but it's, uh, a deep rabbit hole. That's why if you look at, uh, oh, let's see if I can just get it quickly. Uh, that's why I have, I, I particularly picked that background <laughs> for, for the presentation because it's a hole, it's a rabbit hole, you know, you go way, way deep into it. So um, it's, it can be quite complex, um, but get what you need from it. Like I said, tire pressures, temperatures, pretty straightforward, brake temperatures, pretty straightforward um so it's only when you get into the suspension stuff that it can be a bit like whoa um uh but yeah pretty other otherwise pretty straightforward so hope you guys enjoyed it i hope you found it informative um i will be exporting this to my youtube channel so you'll be able to have a, a replay of it um when it's uh, so I'll, I'll do that straight after I end up here uh, or finish up here um, uh, so you guys can use it for reference if you like and I'll try and see you know I like the way Aris with one of his streams uh, the way he sort of sectioned it up so maybe I can do that you know some things uh, so that way it's a little bit easier viewing less uh, uh, tiring <laughs> There's a lot to take in in two and a half hours. Um, but yeah, um, if you guys enjoyed it, uh, you can follow me on Twitch for more streams. Um, so more racing, more driving, less data, less numbers. Um, and I also have a, a YouTube channel, if you'd like to check that out, uh, where I put some, some content I only upload to YouTube uh so kind of more succinct content um and uh yeah and we also host uh races on wednesday nights we have a race going on tomorrow at um zolder at uh 11 p.m gmt 4 p.m pacific summertime 5 p.m mountain summertime uh 6 p.m central summertime and 7 p.m. Eastern Summer Time. So doing a two 30-minute races tomorrow night at Zolder in ACC. Uh, so you can, if you want to find out more information, you can join the Discord, uh, our, our Discord server, which you'll find a little button below the stream to join for that. Um, and we also host uh, kind of enduro, let's say, races or longer races 
uh, on Friday nights, and we'll be doing uh, 10 hours of Suzuka in 60 minutes. So it'll be kind of fun. So the real race is actually 10 hours, but obviously we can't race for 10 hours, at least right not right now. Um, so we'll be doing that on Friday night uh, at the same time. Uh, so you're very welcome to join us for that as well. So for now, I'm going to go get a drink and uh, yeah, and uh, wind down and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, I'll catch you guys again soon. So bye-bye.